As the great philosopher Uncle Sports once said, "It doesn't matter who wins and who loses. Sports always wins." And how truly true that is, Uncle Sports! It is for this reason that we decided to delve into an in-depth physics analysis of the beautiful game of soccer and its forces. Since the dawn of time, the ball has had its own spirit. But using the art of physics, we can attempt to understand and train the inflated spherical beast. But how can we begin to achieve such a magnificent feat? First, what is force? Force is a push or pull acting upon an object as a result with its interaction with another object. The basic formula for force is F equals mass times acceleration, which is Newton's second law of motion. Acceleration of an object is dependent on the net force of mass. There are two primary types of forces: contact forces, which include tension, friction, and air resistance, and action at a distance forces, which include gravitational, electrical, and magnetic. Some of the forces included in the act of playing soccer are applied force, gravitational force, normal force, friction force, and air resistance. Applied force is a force acting on an object by a person or another object. Gravitational force is the force with which the Earth, Moon, or other massively large objects attract another object toward itself. By definition, this is the weight of the object. All objects upon Earth experience a force of gravity that is directed downwards towards the center of the Earth. The force of gravity on Earth is always equal to the weight of the object, as found by the equation force equals mass times gravity, where gravity equals 9.8 newtons per kilogram. The normal force is the support force exerted upon an object that is in contact with another stable object. On occasions, a normal force is exerted horizontally between two objects that are in contact with each other. The friction force is the force exerted by a surface as an object moves across it or makes an effort to move across it. There is at least two types of friction force: sliding and static friction. Air resistance is a special type of friction force that acts upon objects as they travel through the air. The force of air resistance is often observed to oppose the motion of an object. The force will frequently be neglected due to its negligible magnitude. It is most noticeable for objects that travel at high speeds, like a soccer ball, or for objects with large surface areas. In relation to soccer, these individual forces all apply. Applied force occurs when a person interacts with a soccer ball, whether it be kicking, stopping, heading, chest trapping, or controlling the ball. The person is applying the force to control the soccer ball. Gravitational force is applied to the ball while it is in flight. Gravity begins to pull it back down towards the earth. Normal force can be seen in instances when the ball is at rest and acted upon by a person, or when the ball hits a solid, unmoving object like the goalpost and crossbar. Friction force occurs between the foot and the ball. It is also affected by the weather circumstances and the type of surface that the game is being played on, whether it be grass, turf, or an indoor field. Our first example of an applied force in soccer is probably the most obvious when a player strikes a ball. This is a force we decided to analyze using physics. There are many different situations that affect the force a player needs to apply to the ball in order to get it moving at a certain speed. For example, a player could be taking a penalty kick, a corner kick, or simply approaching a ball that isn't moving. In order to get this ball moving at a certain speed, they will need to apply a different force than if the ball was already moving forwards, like if the player was running towards the goal. These two forces will also differ with a ball that is struck while traveling towards a player at a certain speed. How would the applied forces be different? That's what we worked on to figure out. First, we began with both the equation for force mentioned earlier, as well as the impulse-momentum formula of Newton's second law, which is an object's change in momentum is equal to its mass multiplied by its change in velocity. Using substitution, change in momentum is also equal to the force multiplied by the time. We plugged in factors for the equation using 0.45 kilograms as the mass of the soccer ball, 0.05 seconds as the amount of time the ball interacts with the foot, and 30 meters per second as its final velocity and its initial velocity as zero meters per second. 
Inputting these values, we found that the change in momentum is 13.5 kilograms per meters per second. Using this value and the time the ball interacts with the foot, we found that the total force put on a soccer ball at rest to get it moving to 30 meters per second is 270 newtons. We then repeated these same sets to find the amount of force needed to kick a ball that is already moving in the direction that it wants to be kicked. The mass, in velocity, and time the foot interacts with the ball remains the same. However, the change in velocity falls to 20 meters per second as the ball is already moving with the velocity and the direction it is being kicked. From this calculation, we found that 180 newtons of force is needed to cause the ball to travel at 30 meters per second if it has an initial speed of 10 meters per second. Finally, we calculated the force needed for a ball traveling in the opposite direction of a kick. Once again, the rest of the variables remain the same, however the change in velocity is now 40 meters per second because the ball was initially traveling in a different direction of 10 meters per second. From this, we found that 360 newtons of force is required to kick a ball moving in a different initial direction than the kick. A second way that we analyzed striking a soccer ball through forces was how the leg acts as a lever to transfer the force from the muscle down to the ball. In the context of kicking a soccer ball, the leg acts as a third-class lever. The muscle pulls upwards on the bone, providing a force that causes the bottom of the leg, the foot, to move forwards and deliver a force in the same direction on the ball. This is what makes the leg a third-class lever. Knowing this, we were able to find the amount of force required for a person's muscle to apply on the bone in order to get the ball moving at 30 meters per second from rest. We use the formula where the force of the resistance multiplied by the resistance distance to the fulcrum is equal to the force of the effort applied by the distance of the effort to the fulcrum. We found our player's leg to be 3 feet long, which would make up the distance to the resistance. The hamstring starts about a foot down the leg, making the distance to the effort 1 foot. We know that the force of the resistance, or resulting force, is 270 newtons based on earlier calculations. So, in putting these values, we found that the force needed to be placed on the leg by the quad muscle to get the ball moving at 30 meters per second was 810 newtons. Now, it may seem odd that the amount of force applied to the leg is so much larger than the resulting force as levers are often used to reduce the workload due to the mechanical advantage. Third-class levers, however, rarely have a mechanical advantage greater than the one they are used to gain a high velocity at a resistant end. This is why kicking a ball with a third-class lever as your leg is so effective, because the act of the quad contracting increases the velocity at which the leg is traveling when it hits the ball. When looking at the path that the ball takes after it has been kicked, you are really considering its trajectory. Trajectory is the path that a moving object follows through space as a function through time. The trajectory is determined by horizontal speed, vertical speed, height, and the angle of elevation. So, the arc that the ball takes in a certain duration of time after being kicked is its trajectory. The ball was kicked a total distance of 72 feet over 3.2 seconds. This gives a horizontal speed of 22.5 meters per second. Using these values and the force of gravity, the ball's vertical speed was found to be slightly less than 22.1 meters per second. Taking the square root of the sum of the horizontal and vertical velocities, the ball's total velocity can be found. This means that the ball was kicked with a velocity of 31.5 meters per second. Trajectory also includes the height of the ball at the apex of its arc, 24.9 feet, and the angle of its elevation, which was 44.5 degrees. For the every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Force of AB equals the negative force of BA. So if a soccer ball is flying at your head with a force of A and you want to head the ball, you want to provide a force of B. To head the ball, you must strike the ball with your forehead providing a force of B. Done correctly, the soccer ball will reflect off of your forehead with an equal and opposite force and direction, or negative FBA. We see that physics is applied in many ways to the sport of soccer in the movement, the collisions, the kicking, and the traveling of objects through the air. We were able to dissect the beautiful game and expose its many layers of complexity that are translated into the simple form of a recreational game. 
But even as the team studied the sport, we just barely began to understand its elaborate makeup. So you can say it is true, Uncle Sports. Sports do always win.